Welcome to the 2022 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment. Today's session, HIV Anti-Stigma Video Campaign, Someone You Know and Love. Speakers are Mr. Darren Sack, Tim Young, and Alea Baraka. My name is Tracy Gant, and I'm a nurse consultant within HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau, Division of Policy and Data, Clinical Quality Branch and I'm serving as your moderator today. We thank you for joining today's session. As you participate in the session, please feel free to add your questions or comments in the chat box. At the conclusion of the session, the presenters will have the opportunity to address your questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Darren Sack, current members of the Park A Boston Planning Council to briefly introduce his speakers team and their roles on the Boston Planning Council. Darren? Thank you, Tracy. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Darren Sack. Um, I am one of the members of the Boston EMA Planning Council. Um, alongside me, we have Tim Young, who um, is a longtime member of our council, has led what we call our consumer committee, um, as well as been involved in our service prioritization and evaluation committee, or SPEC, as we call it. Our other speaker is Ayla Baraka, who is also a member of our council and a member of the Needs, Resources, and Allocations Committee. Um, and the way we have our council set up is uh, Needs, Resources, and Allocation focuses on the budget, uh, as well as aligning uh, fiscal distribution of monies uh, in conjunction with the priorities that are set. And the priorities and the evaluation of our grantee is managed by the uh, SPEC committee, as we call it. Our other committees that we have, just as a quick FYI, are our consumer committee, which is an open committee, open to any member of our council. The focus on that is what we call consumers or people living with HIV. Um, we funnel all critical and important issues through that committee for their approval, input, and evaluation, as well as special projects such as the anti-stigma campaign video that you will be watching in a few moments. Um, my role on the council uh, last year, I was the chair of the Needs, Resources, and Allocations Committee, and I am currently the chair-elect of the Boston EMA Planning Council. I just want to thank everybody for joining today, and we are so grateful to be part of this, excited, nervous, and everything in between. So I hope you would enjoy the presentation, and we look forward to answering your questions at the end. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. We will now start the presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Ayla and we are from the Boston EMA Planning Council and Darren, Tim and I will be presenting our consumer committee's HIV anti-stigma campaign, you already know and love someone living with, up, with HIV. Without further ado, let's get started. Next slide, please. Just as a quick overview, we're going to tell you about the campaign's purpose, provide a definition for HIV stigma as a basis for our conversation, play the wonderful film, share our experiences and challenges with the making of the film, and finally, how we plan to continue our campaign and further reduce HIV stigma. Next slide, please. So we're on the same page. We're going to be defining HIV stigma using the CDC definition. HIV stigma is negative attitudes and beliefs about people with HIV. It is a prejudice that comes with labeling an individual as part of a group that is believed to be socially unacceptable. CDC 2021. HIV stigma is pervasive and can result in acts of discrimination, such as an employer not hiring someone based on their HIV status, a family member refusing to drink from the same cup, or uncomfortable body language that tells a person will have living with HIV that they are unwelcomed in a space. We know that HIV stigma can lead a person living with HIV to have negative, to have a negative self image, feel fear around disclosing their status to others, and suffer from mental illnesses such as anxiety and depression. Next slide, please. Now, we are the Boston EMA Planning Council, and our purpose is to confront and dismantle the stigma that surrounds the HIV AIDS epidemic. Our mission is that this campaign will illuminate the stigma surrounding HIV AIDS by empowering people living with HIV to share their personal experiences. In 2020, the Consumer Committee, 
one of the five subcommittees of the Boston EMA Planning Council created a campaign idea in order to confront and dismantle the stigma that still surrounds the HIV AIDS epidemic. They named it, You Already Know and Love Someone Living with HIV. This campaign draws from the personal experiences of people living with HIV, and these stories will be used to educate the general public and dispel harmful myths about people living with HIV. Our hope is that our audiences will think about the people they know and love in their lives and realize they may already have a closer relationship with someone living with HIV. And now I'm going to pass this off to Darren to discuss the film production. Thank you, Ayla. Next slide, please. I'm going to spend a minute talking about film production and recruiting our participants. In order to bring our campaign to life, we formed an ad hoc committee that began creating the blueprint for filming a video that we could use to share our stories and disseminate across a wide variety of audiences. With the help of Planning Council support, we sent out a request for a proposal to find a video production company who would work with us. After several interviews, we had a good feeling about audio chemist and hired them. They worked with our committee to create a film script. Then they did a first round of interviews on Zoom with participants in order to pull out content, as well as form specific questions that would be used for the in-person filming. This helped us better utilize the time in person during the interviews, as well as craft a storyline. Once first interviews were completed, Audio Chemist worked with our participants to identify locations that would meet each person's needs, given that we were still early in the COVID epidemic at this time. Filming locations ranged from people's homes to offices, as well as various public spaces. The film crew interviewed participants for hours, chronicling the details of our personal stories. They acted with much care and respect for us, as well as understanding and to the subject matter. During the film editing stages, they took our feedback seriously and incorporated changes we wanted to make. In the end, they produced several versions of the videos at varying lengths of time to be used for different purposes. Today, we will be featuring the 12 minute version of our video. Next slide, please. In addition to, we also hired a web design company to create a campaign website where the video would live along with our biographies and associated additional information. The committee worked with this company to create the vision, content, and color scheme. And similar to the video editing, Wild Apple showed us their first iteration and incorporated our feedback until the final product was completed. Next slide, please. Without further ado, we would like to share our film with you. When the virus began, a few people started to get sick, but it went on to spread quite rapidly. Men, women, and even children were all affected, including people of all races and economic backgrounds. People were afraid and didn't know what they were dealing with. The government hadn't fully recognized the problem until many lives were lost, and entire communities began to feel the impact. These stories you are about to hear are just a few of the examples of how fragile the human condition is and how judgment and stigma have been counterproductive to the compassion and understanding we all strive for within our communities. The ability to love and be loved is paramount in all our lives. It was the 1980s. In 1985, uh, when Shirley was first diagnosed, there were hardly any supports for her. She went to the doctor's appointment to find out her status, pretty much confident that she would be testing negative. But she was testing positive, and the healthcare provider that saw her uh, was very upset and told Shirley her status, but also told her not to come back. The first question that somebody asked us back then was, how'd you get your HIV? And why were they asking that? Well, the excuse at the time was, based on how you were infected, could change my course of treatment for you. And that could be sitting in a stretcher in the emergency room for 18 plus hours, and in a hallway that was isolated, so they weren't around anybody else. No button to click or call for help 
And even if you did, you would be lucky if somebody would come help you. That's how bad it was. People are afraid of what they don't know. And most folks didn't really know, you know, didn't really understand what HIV was. When I would go to family functions, I could feel, you know, people feeling a certain way about me being there. You would sit down at a table and everybody else would have nice china and you would have disposable place settings in front of you. And that was commonplace back then. They didn't invite us to the house anymore or stuff like that. But we have plenty of friends. Uh, so we lose a couple. Uh, do I be mad at them or should I be mad at myself? Maybe I had to explain myself right. You know, over time, that ceased. And I think part of that was because folks saw me thriving. El cariño de una familia y el apoyo de una familia hace una diferencia en la persona, en el adicto y en la persona enferma del VIH. I started my disclosure process to my mother. It was very emotional. I told her that I'm okay physically, but mentally I had some work. And she understood that and actually started educating herself on HIV. And I just touched my mom and I said, Mom, you're going to have to hold it together because I can't right now. She just looked at me and said, We're going to be OK. We're going to be OK. And you're going to live. You're going to live. My mother took it and understood it for what it was. My dad, not so much. Al principio, mami no entendía y me recuerdo que ella le pasaba cloro a los toiles. Me sentí triste, pero mi mamá no lo hizo por mal. Porque yo sé que ella me quiere mucho. Yo sé que ella ha sido un support. When Shirley told me that she tested positive, I knew that if I did stay, that it would be because I wanted to, because I loved Shirley, and because I wanted our relationship to last for as long as it could. With Lamar, there were no conditions. It wasn't, ah, uh, you have to be this type of person for me, or carry yourself in this manner in order for me to love you. You know, they started talking about goals. They started talking about the future. And I'm like, I love this. Greg is my heart. He's everything to me. To have a partner like Greg, it's everything because it means that I have somebody that I can lean on, that I can depend on, and who loves me and doesn't look at anything that I have as something that lessens me as a person. Mi abuela para mí es mi todo. Y yo me recuerdo cuando yo le dije, ella todavía estaba en su mente correcta para entender. Me recuerdo que ella me besaba, me tocaba, me decía tantas cosas bonitas. You know, one of the first things that I needed to do was make amends to my then 15-year-old son. Even to this day, that was probably one of the most difficult conversations that I've ever had. My daughters on the bad days are the reason I get out of bed and get up at all sometimes, honestly. I vividly remember it was a Saturday morning, and one of them came up to me and started asking questions about HIV. And the question that got me, and is still even hard to talk about, because it's an emotional baggage they don't need, was, well, you're going to be OK, right, Daddy? I can say that after all those years of me being a failed father in a lot of ways, that my son now gets it, and he's proud of his dad. We usually have a spread in the backyard. Everybody's invited, you know, that's family. There are no judgments that day. Everybody comes to eat. Well, there is a judgment because it's really food and everybody wants it. There was something that was motivating about fear that I think is missing today. The average time to death from diagnosis with HIV or an AIDS diagnosis was six to 18 months. I was around 13 or 14 years old overhearing a conversation with the providers and my parents. And the conversation was, you know, what should we expect? 
And I vividly remember them saying, well, enjoy the time you have with Darren and you'd be lucky if he makes it to 16. If you're diagnosed today, you're not going to have the health conditions that you would have like someone like me from 20 years ago or someone in like friends of mine that have had it for 40 years. But at the same time, you look at life a little bit differently or a lot differently because you, you understand that if I don't take care of me, I will die. Hoy día le digo a ustedes los jóvenes, cuando dicen, oh, I'll take prep, I'm going to be fine, girl, no. I want to see people stop dying. They still are. They're not in the percentages that, that we used to, but there's still a lot of people who we've lost over the years. And I don't want anybody to ever forget what those early years were like. One of the things that I learned from those early advocates was each one teach one and there shouldn't be anything about us without us. If we didn't push back and do something, we were just going to be pushed aside and no, nobody would be there to help. It was in prison that I realized that this is what I wanted to do. And when I got to know some of these people and talk with them, I realized that they needed a voice, somebody to stand up for them, somebody to take some of the weight and I was willing to do that. Me convertí en ese advocate para personas porque ahí en ese momento dije, no, tengo que volver a esa vida, ayudar personas para que no pasen por el proceso que yo pasé. We've done a lot of work. People have put in so much time, effort, and they're wonderful people. But with all of that, we've got an awful lot more to do. This will be my 40th year since my diagnosis, and we are talking here about stigma and you know what? That was our number one problem in the beginning and what made this so hard and what makes HIV different than other chronic illnesses because there's an attachment to it that's exceptionally emotional for those of us who were around in the early days who were diagnosed and even people who weren't. I look at the people from 40 years ago and I think, God, what they've been through, what they've seen, who they've lost, what they've lived through, it's just such an honor to talk to people and hear their stories. And at the end of the day, human beings and human beings are the only ones who can really heal each other is by talking and building dialogue. Raymond no es solamente adicción. Raymond no es solamente HIV, VIH. Raymond no es solamente homelessness. Hay más en mi vida. I am a person living with HIV, but I have goals and I want to continue living life. If we could just listen and see with our hearts and not so much with our eyes, we could open and change our minds about everything. You can live and live productively and have a whole life and be HIV positive and have relationships and all of that, you know? And that's a beautiful thing. It's only one life. You're going to live it. You might as well live it the way you want to live it and be happy. It is through education and advocacy that we begin to look beyond an HIV diagnosis. We start to see each other as human beings, interconnected as a society. It's been almost 40 years since the height of the epidemic, and yet, many of the challenges still remain. These stories are just a few of the examples of perseverance, strength, and love. I find my strength in my partner, family, friends, and community who show me respect and kindness. I find it through my love of acting on stage. But real life is not theater. It's about the connections we make with one another. Our message to you is that you already know and love someone living with HIV. You might be their spouse, partner, or ally, whether you know it or not. You may have even seen parts of yourself in the stories you've heard. Our strength as a whole lies in our ability to see each other fully beyond a diagnosis. Love transcends HIV and compassion binds us together.
we hope that you all enjoyed the film. It means a lot to us. We are lucky to have received recognition, including but not limited to the official launch of the anti-stigma campaign at a public event at Boston City Hall with a speaker panel that included video participants as members of our families, which was moderated by Mayor Kim Janey's office. The video has also won the first place award from the Howard University International Conference on Stigma and was selected amongst over 80 other participants, as well as a published article in .com. I'm going to turn things over to Tim now. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Uh, I'm going to speak to you about challenges of filming, slide nine. This project did not come without major challenges. The biggest of all being that we originally started with working with a different film production company who were very disorganized and unprofessional. They missed deadlines, showed up late, and didn't do a great job responding to us. Once we completed filming with them, we found that the audio had so much background noise that the footage was unusable. After months of struggling to work with them, we were faced with the reality we'd have to start over and find a different company to work with. As a result of how much time and emotional energy folks had already spent with being prepped and interviewed the first time, several people decided rescheduling would not be possible and they would not be telling their stories again. There were also challenges with establishing locations to do the filming. It was important to all of us to pick a private space where we could feel safe enough to share very personal stories in front of a camera crew. However, interviews took place early in the early, early in the COVID-19 pandemic. Between mask wearing and utilizing private indoor and outdoor spaces, we found solutions that worked for each of us. For me, we decided to use a local New Hampshire theater. I have performed at multiple times and most recently, and will perform that in the fall. <clears throat> the theater allowed us complete privacy. We were able to use the stage and community room where we were able to socially distance the camera crew, the team of three, myself and my partner, Greg. They were patient, kind and very respectful and very understanding and certainly patient with my blindness and were very and were were very uh compelled to be moved by my own story uh now we're going to move on to slide 10 thank you this is the consumer experience what was it like to be part of the project for me it was cathartic. It was one of the best experiences I have ever had. I felt healed after because I had shared bits and pieces, but I got to speak about my own journey with HIV on video publicly, which I'm not used to. I am a loud person, but a quiet activist. It taught me that I don't have to be afraid. I feel much freer. For Darren and the others, it was a different, yet somehow the same experience. Now I'd like to pass this off to Darren so he can share some of his consumer experience. Darren. Thank you, Tim. You know, the time it took being interviewed was emotional, in particular when we had to do this multiple times, and brought back many historic memories, particularly those from very early on in the epidemic. As difficult and hard and sad at times as it is to talk about this, it's incredibly rewarding. And for me to ensure we never forget the beginning and early years of this epidemic, nor the people who we've lost along the way. And we learned from those painful years, as well as helping people move forward with reducing stigma associated with HIV disease. I'll turn it back over to you, Tim. Thank you. 
I'm always, I'm always so moved by your story, Darren. Uh, next, we'll move to slide 11. Thank you. Continuing the campaign. Uh, we participated in some high school storytelling as a continuation of our campaign efforts. We participated in four different panels at two different high schools in the Boston area this year. Panelists discussed their, high, their, their journey and how stigma has played a role in their lives. The video was shown, followed by a Q&A session. Student evaluations let us know the panel helped increase general knowledge about HIV treatment, as well as increase compassion for the hardships that many of us have faced. I also wanna say that a student on a side note hugged me after uh, and said, thank you for sharing your story. So that meant a lot to me. The school has since then asked us to come back again as often as we can to continue educating their students in the future. We want to attend conferences and film festivals to continue telling the story that need to be told, reach different community groups, and transform belief systems. Next slide 12, please. Huh. Envisioning a future without stigma. Whew, that's a big one. <laughs> Lastly, we'd like to leave you with our vision for a future without HIV stigma. That'll be the day, please. In the future, and in that world, HIV is treated like any other chronic illness. People living with HIV would not feel ashamed of disclosing their status or have fear around how others will react. There will be no judgment about HIV, one's HIV status, but rather, regardless of status, We'd see each other as human beings, deserving of love and respect. On behalf of Ella, Darren, and myself, we'd like to thank you all for joining us. Okay. Actually, I want to just say uh, we're giving you all a round of applause, virtual round of applause for that. Um, if we can get through the question and answer without, without the tears, but that was exceptional. Thank you very much for the work you put in uh, to present this video to us. So before we begin our Q&A session, um, uh, you know, we just say kudos to the team. Your your emotion showed through the video. Um, it's an impactful story. I think that would be valuable for uh, anyone viewing the video. Um, we ask that you put your questions into the chat box. Um, I will. Uh, we will go through them and read them out. Um, but uh, honestly, I think this type of presentation may not have that many questions, but really may be comments and words of um, appreciation to you all. So I would say for the audience, please feel free to add anything you want to say into the chat box. And Darren, I want to turn this over to you to just um, uh, impart any words that you would like related to uh, to the video itself. Sure. Um, let me back up for one moment and just say, um, you saw a handful of us on the video. Uh, Tim and I were both uh, actually participants in it. However, this was the end result of approximately a two to two and a half year effort with many, many people behind the scenes helping us, helping us prop this up, helping make sure things moved forward, and also helping us try to focus and align as to what did we want to accomplish with the campaign. Our hope with this is that this is the beginning of um, a campaign that we can bring not only across the Massachusetts and New Hampshire region that we formally cover, 
um, but expand well beyond that. And as well as potentially um, looking to expand this and maybe allow others to share their stories in some way, shape or form. So um, this is the early phases of a, a multi-phase and multi-year body of work, I believe. And our intent this year is to, um, if you go to the website right now, I will, I will be very blunt. Our content is somewhat light. Uh, there's basic components on it, but the goal was to get the video out and, and get it disseminated and start to gauge interest and see how people reacted to it. I can tell you from the sessions that we've done locally or within our region, um, which are very similar to this. So we, we have a little dialogue, we show the video, we open it up for Q&A. Um, we have yet to be able to finish the dialogue and questions after the fact, and um, not in a sense of, you know, oh, very specific X, Y, Z questions, really um, things like how, how can we try to keep going forward or what was the experience like and other things. Um, I will say, and, and Tim shared this in his formal comments on the video, um, please keep in mind, we did this twice. So um, we actually had several participants originally who couldn't do it again. Um, and what do I mean by we did this twice? Well, as Tim shared, we had two production companies uh, that helped us. The first one did not work out, but each one consisted of anywhere from six to 10 hours of direct involvement with those of us who participated. And I will say for myself, and I believe I can speak for the others, um, and Tim, feel free to, to chime in as well, but it was exhausting. It was emotional. Um, for me in particular, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's an emotional guy, yeah. Brings up, <laughs> brings up a lot of tough, tough memories, mm -hmm. good and bad. And the, uh, the comment that I share a lot is um, HIV has let me and others see the best and the worst humanity has to offer. And I will tell you for those, you know, first 15 or 20 years, <laughs> it was it was mostly the worst, but it wasn't all that. And I have been, I and others have, have been um, able to meet some of the most amazing people ever uh, that I never would have crossed paths with. Um, people from different areas, we grew up in different ethnic groups, different experiences, yet I, I can also say on the consumer side, we can finish each other's sentences. And, you know, I say to the community, well, well why is that? Um, that I have concerns about that. It means we're not done. Um, However, we are really focusing on trying to break down those barriers and make this um, quite bluntly, you know, just another chronic disease. And the first response people have, even in their head when they hear, I have HIV or I have AIDS, isn't, how'd you get it? It's, is there anything I can do to help? Do you need anything? You know, that's sort of the classic, you tell somebody you have cancer and usually it's, how can I help? Um, certainly not running away. Um, so things have gotten better. In some ways, they've gotten worse. This, this is still very insidious. And I will say, I think a lot of the, the stigma and people's reactions to it now is more behind the curtain or less overt because it's not generally considered acceptable. However, that's not completely the case for everybody. And we still have every, every story out there has a different experience, um, whether it was a, a difficult family reaction, losing a friend, losing a a colleague or somebody that you're um, emotionally or sexually involved in. And it just would be nice, you know, I've been doing this 42 years, it, it would be nice to see that go away. And that's our goal. It's a lofty one. And we freely admit that. Um, I'm going to stop here. I know we I think we have a lot of questions in there. There, and there are there. some great questions coming up. And uh, I'm going to actually start with with this one. Um, what issues or barriers did you face when bringing this information to the school system? And what advice do you have for others to bring that education to our own school communities? Great uh, Tim and Ayla, I think I should probably take this one given I, I had direct experience, but um, please let me know. Um, so I can tell you that when, uh, so I was diagnosed when I was 12, that was in 1981. In 1985, my family and I went public. And by that, I mean, we agreed and started to be interviewed as a family who had a child infected with HIV. 
our goal at the time was threefold, um, helping people understand I was not a direct danger to somebody in the general public. Um, that there was a difference between the HIV and AIDS diagnosis. And back in the early days, that was a big deal. That literally was the, even if it was just mentally, do I have the six to 18 months or do I maybe have two to four years? Maybe. Um, and then the other part of our battle at that time was um, going to school. So I, I am proud to say that my family's work and I, what we did back then, Massachusetts became the first state in the country to um, pass legislation that required public and private schools to allow children with HIV to attend. Um, we'll sort of history footnote there. Um, not that our names are attached to it, but just something proud that we've been involved in. I will say that didn't come without a gigantic fight. So for us, what happened was the newspaper and TV interviews caused this flurry of disinformation to fly around the school. And I think this still happens today. Um, within a day or so after I was on the front page of our local paper, the rumors around the school was there were six kids with, with HIV and AIDS running around the school, biting other kids and poking them with pencils and other things, all, all completely untrue. And then, then we had a walkout in the school that I was in the middle of. They were protesting the fact that I was there, but nobody said anything or even knew I was there. It was a really good summary of the unfathomable hysteria that surrounded HIV in those early, early days. What I would say to somebody today, uh, twofold. First off, I, I would hope that we're not fighting that basic fight of saying, is it safe for you to allow children infected with HIV to attend the school? I think we've squared that away. Um, but if not, the way that we handled that was education, 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 and more education and dialogue. We brought our providers in to speak with the school, the school administration as well as anybody who was willing to listen. Um, that would be my recommendation even today. I can also tell you that uh, I'm, I'm proud, but ridiculously and embarrassingly lucky that I never missed a day of school due to my HIV. I will tell you back in the eighties, that was unheard of. You saw, or for those of you who, who saw Ryan's mother talk this morning, all I remember is we were all going through the same stuff at the same time. And I will also say I'm disgusted that people think it's okay. It's hard enough <laughs> being a teenager or a kid at times, um, certainly being a teenager, to lump an illness like this on top. Um, even nowadays where we say, you know, we're comfortable that we think we can keep your illness at bay and make this a chronic illness. It's still a very, very heavy emotional baggage. Um, but, but that persistent dialogue with the school and the people who are involved with the child, as well as um, challenging, but in a productive way, you know, why are you concerned? What are the issues you, you think that are, are present here? And why do you think there's an issue with my child going to school? I, I really hope that's not as, as prevalent um, as I think it might be, but I suspect well, that. Darren, yeah. can, I, can I step in real quick? Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about when we brought this to the schools for them to see recently, um, mm -hmm. I was part of two of the panels. And uh, as far as the children go, uh, you know, having their uh, their curiosity, their intrigue, uh, a lot of them didn't know how you can get it um, and that it is still such a prevalent problem. And to meet people with HIV, it was, you know, really reassuring for us to hear them embrace it and really want to know more. and. That, that thirst for knowledge and for curiosity of who we are as people and not just the faces of HIV, that for me was a moving thing. And, and I spoke a little bit about that, that one of the children afterwards asked to hug me and we're talking you know, during the pandemic. So uh, we were socially distant, but he said, I'm wearing a mask, is it okay if I hug you? And I said, absolutely, I will take a hug in a heartbeat um, because I know for me, coming from New Hampshire, going all the way to Boston to, takes two hours. So it was well worth the trip because, you know, they want us to come back year after year to show the video, uh, not just our stories, but whatever branches off from this. So to be able to share that with them and for them to ask us to come back. And I will say that for me, 
I was raped and that's how I became HIV positive. And I was afraid that the, the delicacy of me, you know, not being able to talk about the how and the why, you know, not that that's important, but it's part of my story. And I asked, you know, the moderator, I said, is it okay if I, if I mention, she said, oh, please, they are open to hear things. These kids are kids of the world now that they have heard this stuff, if not from you, from the kids in the playground. So it's important for them to hear every aspect of this. So for me, it was a real honor to be able to speak openly, have a dialogue with them, answer their questions, um, and just really feel encouraged and embraced by them. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, and I hope that we get to show this year after year. Uh, we continue to branch off with more participants. Um, I think it's a wonderful campaign. I'm telling you, every time I watch it, I am so moved by it that I am in tears. And not just because it brings me back to when I was going through it with my diagnosis, but because I know a lot of these people, I know all of them on the on the panel, but uh, the participants, you know, their stories move me every time I hear somebody's story because I stop and I listen and I'm blind. So, you know, all I could do is listen, but uh, it's an honor to hear these stories. And I think that if we just, like I said, just start listening with this and not so much with these. Exactly. There, there are a few comments that I want to make sure that are heard. So a uh, comment from Darren Stanley. So maybe we can place it on our webpage. The Philadelphia Center North Louisiana HIV AIDS Resource Center in Shreveport, Louisiana. Let me know and I will support however possible. Another Absolutely. Comment. Absolutely. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Another comment. Um, I think health classes should be put back into classes. It's like they are non-existent. I think I'm 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 kind of seeing a a theme or, or around the bringing it to the high schools. Uh, health classes definitely should be required in our school system. I also agree. Kids these days are more socially aware now and should have a safe place to have these discussions in school. As a long-term survivor, twelve years plus seems small compared to some. However, as a peer educator, HIV advocate, it's all of our experiences that will keep me teachable and teaching others that we sometimes still feel we are our diagnosis, but we are still just human. I want to go to two other, and, and actually, Darren, you answered some of it, but it's probably worth it expanding on it a bit. Um, and were there any tools that you all use when you approach the high schools? And how were the panels developed um, for working in the high schools? So I can talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> um, so this was in uh, the city of Boston. So it was a, a couple of the inner city schools that uh, the panels spoke at recently. Um, I was not part of the panels, um, so I, I will share that but I, I did hear that it was a wonderful experience. Um, we ended up being able to do that because we had a colleague who previously sat on the planning council um, who was working at the school system. So uh, one of our support staff reached out to her and said, hey, do you, do you think we could do something like this? Would you all be interested? And we actually had to say no to it. They wanted us to do a whole slew of these and we, we just set it to a couple. Um, it just challenges with logistics and setting it up and getting people there. Uh, in terms of the panel participants, uh, that was it was a little tough getting people. Um, we were asking for volunteers, so we I will say we did first go to the video participants, um, which is really important to us. Anytime we have an opportunity to share this with a wider audience, uh, our intent is to offer the opportunity to the participants first, and then if we have gaps or additional holes, that we would try to fill those with others. Um, which is actually nice. And we did bring in a number of other people who were not directly involved uh, and not even part of the planning council, which I think gives a, a great different perspective um, and really a wide range of experience. I also want to share just very quickly, um, my, I have twin daughters, um, Jenna and Nicole, you, uh, you saw them in the video. Um, 
two things. One, I am really proud. They participated in the panel that we had at, at Boston City Hall when we launched the video. And they actually, they spoke better than I did answering questions. Um, and, and I'm so proud and, oh my God, I'm just so proud of them. And I'm, I'm so bothered that they have to be so acutely aware of this and all of the stuff that goes on top of it. I will say they go to the same school I did. So this was a school that back in early 1980s didn't let Darren miss a day of school, held their ground at potentially great cost to any of them at the time, be it their jobs or even personal safety. Um, my daughters haven't had five minutes of HIV education in the four years that they went to that high school. And that's a supportive and friendly high school. We're seeing a persistent theme with that. And one of the things that we're trying to do at the state and regional level is get back into the school systems. Um, we're not teaching our younger kids. We're not teaching our older kids. We're not teaching our college age people. We're not even teaching medical providers about HIV, even in a basic sense. I'll share one comment that came out of the um, post panel. What did you learn during the panel? And this was not just one individual who said it, um, but it was, I didn't know that girls could get HIV. So that alone tells me we're not even covering the fundamentals of the basics and arming our younger generation. I'd actually like to ask Ayla to talk. Ayla, what's your, what was your experience? I mean, I, I'm not picking on you because I call you younger, but you've been through the schooling system a lot more recently than certainly Tim and I have. What, what was your experience? Watch it, Darren, so talking about age, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are awesome but from my experience since I kind of not necessarily recently but maybe more recently than my colleagues Tim and Darren from high school um is that there in my I was um able to have an experience learning HIV um and AIDS in my high school but it was more of like one chapter, one curriculum, and then we went on to like gonorrhea or something like that. Like it wasn't necessarily something that was like heavily focused on. It was one page of another chapter of our health book. And I think that as I got older in my education and started to like become more interested um, in healthcare, that I went down the rabbit hole of learning more about um, HIV and AIDS. But I feel like for leagues or peers or was in high school it was more of just like a one and done like if you learned about it you learned about it but if you didn't you didn't and you just kept on going and so like going back to the very first question about like how do you bring this stuff into like schools I think you can just bring it in and the students who suck it up like sponges like they have like not generally assuming anything about students or anything but like I think everybody's always happy to listen and learn, especially when you're a student. And so when you just give them the curriculum to learn about it, then they will. Um, so, yeah. Right, and I, I wanted to add to that too, if you don't mind, uh, Darren and Ayla, uh, is that you know we wanna bring this to colleges because I don't think there's even a lot of talk there. So uh, we wanna go to colleges, we wanna go to you know community colleges, you know private universities and colleges. Uh, well, universities that aren't private, but yeah, uh, but we, I really feel that, that it is because kids are so open to hearing stuff now, um, and because they want to know, they have this thirst to know, and as if it's only one chapter in a book, I mean, how do they, how do we expect them to be curious about it? Like, oh, it must not matter. Let's look to the next chapter. So I really feel like we need to focus on that. I do. There is one comment that I, um, by Christine, um, I am so happy the individuals were so diverse, especially including a Spanish speaking individual in Spanish. Yeah. Kudos to you all on um, uh, inclusivity throughout the video. Another comment from uh, Drexel Shaw, um, would love to connect with the group to see how we could educate our internal colleagues about HIV stigma um one other comment um and this is from ebony murray uh prep navigator for southeast mississippi rural health initiative uh, mississippi has an abstinence abstinence plus campaign 
for the schools here, although our state has very high rates for HIV, any suggestions on how we can reach high schoolers with this barrier? And I, I would say um, if you can answer it from the, I guess from the perspective of breaking through the barrier of getting into, one, getting into the school system overall, um, but speaking about topics that some may perceive as sensitive. Um, and I will actually add on to that question with a comment from Helen um, about what did the stigma with monkeypox um, make you re relive too much? Men having sex with men really said, okay, that's been on the news. And I'm like, okay, listen, first of all, they were scared of us because of HIV and AIDS. Now they're scared of us because of monkeypox. And I just thought, oh boy, we are stepping back again. Like, can we just talk about the fact this is a virus and this will happen and will go around and will not just be with gay men, it'll be with straight women, with, with young children, with animals even. It, it, it is not something that, that chooses one particular lifestyle. It says, yes, it's more predominant in this, but it doesn't mean it's only in one category and that's it. And we should just be afraid of those people who have that. I, I totally see monkeypox and COVID-19 and HIV, mm -hmm. all these viruses, that we can relate to all of the stigma that was around it. Like, oh boy, I just, I feel like we step back so often and with, you know, Roe v. Wade being turned back, I'm like, listen, people, abstinence is a wonderful thing in theory. Now I'm abstinent, you know, Greg, and I call Greg my partner, but he, you know, he's my landlord and my best friend. And we were together for 20 years, but we have not been together for almost eight. So because of that, you know, I still call him my partner because he's my partner in life. He helps me with my finances. He helps me see things at home, you know, but, but for me, it's like, you know, people go, oh, okay, right. I, I get it. So I understand where you're coming from with it. Well, no, not really. <clears throat> I mean, but abstinence in theory is a wonderful thing, but it really isn't something that can really be obtained as a whole. I mean, Honestly, I, I just think we have to step outside of that and say, listen, yes, absence would be great, but why don't we educate on all levels in case they are having sex? That's well said, Tim. I think that's okay. the, the balance that we try to strike when we go out to places, in particular, be it a community or a state or a region <clears throat> that maybe... Um, how do I put this delicately, less receptive to talking about, you know, issues like sexual activity, intravenous drug use, sort of all those things that many people like to say, well, I kind of know it's there, but if it's not me, you know, it's it, put it in the background and I'm not going to, and those are bad people, I don't worry about it. Um, so I, I will say, I'll, I'll go back to the earlier days because I, I think that's maybe where we are with schools at the moment is trying to help them understand that the perception that HIV is fixed and somebody simply needs to take a few pills every day is, is just not accurate. And trying to get that message to them to say, let us, let us talk to your children. Let us talk <clears throat> to the people who are teaching at your institutions. Let us clear up uh, or dispel myths and um, bad information. I've seen a, a couple of comments in the chat about things that, um, People's kids have been told, you know, completely inaccurate information. To me, that's more dangerous than no information at all. Mm -hmm. But the way that we market this, and we've been pretty successful when we actually go directly at, at a place or a system is, you know, let us give your children the information to make appropriate decisions that will keep them safe. It is not pushing sexual activity, it is not pushing intravenous drug use, it is simply talking about the facts, how this can impact you and what the effect might be. The really powerful piece that we've been able to give, and it's unfortunate because in the last 15 to 20 years, I've had a lot of people say, you know what, I don't really want to hear your story. I've heard this stuff a million times. And yet when we go into a place and talk about it, people go, oh my gosh, I didn't know 
stuff like this happened. I didn't know people treated you all like this. I didn't know this happens, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago or last week. Um, so it's, it's that tempering of, you know, we got to get in there, but um, you can't go in with a bulldozer, especially in a place that's, that's really challenging or pushing back. So um, I don't know how much that's helpful for the, the folks who are asking that question, but those are the strategies I've, I've seen and been part of, and, and they work pretty effectively when we're trying to get in somewhere. Can I also say too, that when we go in, we don't have an agenda. We're only telling our stories to educate, to kind of help them understand a little bit better as to what HIV can look like, but that there's no, you know, oh, checklist of, oh, well, they look sick. People have said to me, you don't look sick. Oh, really? Okay. Well, tell my pills that I take every day because, you know, I can't take a one and done kind of thing because I have other health conditions, kidney disease, other things that complicate my life other than the fact that I take one pill and forget about the disease. I live with this every day. And if you want to live with it every day, then keep doing what you're doing. But good luck, because I honestly, it breaks my heart when I, I want to say to people, you can do better, you can choose better, you can make better choices for yourself. Uh, there are bad things out there. There are bad people out there. There are bad viruses out there. But it's what you do to take care of yourself that's important. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, excellent, excellent. Uh, we have about three minutes left. And well, first I want to say how whatever a standing ovation looks like virtually, we offer you all a standing ovation for your video and for your final overall discussion. This was very informative and appreciated. Thank you so much. So really, I want to thank everyone for your participation today um, as part of the HIV AIDS Bureau's efforts to provide you with timely topics and interesting speakers. We appreciate you filling out the session's evaluation at the end of the session. Uh, if you are seeking continuing education credits, um, please complete the additional evaluation for credit. Um, and those are found uh, once you go to your, your um, uh, platform page. Um, I, if there are any final words from the presenters, um, Tracy, the, can, I also, can, I, Tracy <laughs> can I also, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, no, I just ahead. want to say quickly, for any groups out there that are part of an HIV group that would like to do what we have done and kind of mold themselves and model themselves after what we've done, please let us know because we would be more than happy to help with that. We would like this to be a national campaign. We'd like to see other states participate in something like this. Absolutely. I think there's, if you're following the, the chat box, there's a lot of interest. I'm pretty sure yep. you'll see a lot of traffic uh, to your webpage and, um, and reaching out to you all. Did you all include your contact? Also to interrupt. Sure. Um, we also have an Instagram to shamely insert that. Um, it's by someone you know, and <laughs> someone you know and love. So you can check that out. I wonder if we can like add it to the chat. I'll try to like text it to the chat. But it's an Instagram, someone you know and love, um, and it has like our logo with the heart. If you want to check that out as well, absolutely. Put it in the chat box. I'm sure everyone will grab it. The heart the ribbon, I designed that, by the way, as a blind person. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so just, That's my shameless plug. <laughs> just, for, just for ease of, or quick memory for folks, um, the, the URL is someone you know and love, all one word, dot com. That, that's it. We tried to make it simple and easy for folks to remember. Um, we are very much hoping that we can expand this campaign greatly. Um, I've already been chatting with Christina, who's our HRSA officer. And um, I, I think, you know, if we can, I'd maybe like to bring it to a chat session or something else mm -hmm. um, over the next year. And our, our next phase is expansion and um, additional dissemination, at least of the original campaign, um, right. but also dialogue on how might we be able to incorporate others' stories perhaps. Um, and whether we make it something quick and easy or maybe we make it something more involved, all open for dialogue. Um, I, I've, our contact information is in uh, the conference registration agenda. I'd be happy to mediate any conversations back to our team. 
Um, so feel feel free to reach out directly to me um, yeah. that piece. And and thank I, you everyone for coming. Please, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I just I just to to end my comments want to say um, one of the reasons this was so important to me is I. I've met and lost a lot of really wonderful people over the years, as have many of us. Um, it is not okay that we're forgetting about them and what they and those of us who are still around went through. Mm -hmm. And we can never let that happen again. Um, I will say COVID, you know, I, I get really, really upset when I hear, we've never seen anything like this. COVID spreading everywhere and it's hitting everybody. Yeah, yeah, we kind of did, but uh, I can't believe nobody on the national level ever even brought that topic up on a news show that I saw. Um, so anyhow, I, I'm so grateful to be here. Tim and Ayla, I'm honored to be part of this group with you. And thank you so much for your work and effort getting us here today. And I hope that we did justice to the folks who are in the video and in particular, those whose memories we are working to carry on and, and keep the message of um, hope and and love for all of us and empathy moving forward. So um, Tracy and others, thank you so much for letting us be here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone. Jo thank enjoy you the rest of your presentations.